Hey there, welcome back to the Off Shift Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Anthony Trucks, and today we have Thomas Dieri. Now, Thomas is an interesting guy, but he did something really cool that I, I really respect and honor. Um, if you know anything about my, my life and my world, my wife actually serves individuals with special needs. So does Thomas Dieri. And what he did is his dad and him uh, came across this idea of like, let's, let's help these individuals who have special needs create a business where they can actually create income, they can create skill sets, and actually have personal pride. And so they developed a business, Car Wash in Florida, where they tripled the revenue of the business while also hiring about 90% special needs individuals. So they have this entire situation and business built off this. And what's really cool is it's not just something where you can look at it and go, oh, I don't work with special needs, I don't know anything, how they can serve me. No, this actually can help you to understand what they've done to to systemize, to simplify, to serve people at a super high level. So you can actually trickle it back to what, what you're doing in your own life and go, man, if I apply this lesson, I could have some cool outcomes because he has learned to build an amazing business uh, with individuals who you wouldn't t typically think are the ones you would work with. So make sure you tune in and try to extract as many lessons as you can from this episode of how you can apply it to your life. And if you have got a chance yet, uh, make sure you go to, if you haven't, www.magicmind.co forward slash shift or use the code ah shift to get 20% off your actual first batch of magic mind it's a product that i use every single day i love it. it's a little green juice that's good for my brain good for my body keeps me focused keeps me moving in these long thinking work days which if you're a person like myself i'm constantly thinking spinning my wheels and if i if i don't keep my brain fueled my body my life don't get fueled to do what i want so make sure you go to magicmind.co use the code aww shift to get 20% off Honestly, I personally have used this for over a year, swear by it. Check it out. You're not going to be disappointed. I swear I could use words. <laughs> Outside of that, hop into the episode. I'll see you over there. Hey, hey, we're back. So uh, you already know who he is because I gave the introduction. Let's rock and roll. Welcome to the show, Thomas Derry. How are you, man? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me on, Anthony. I'm really excited to, to speak with you today. I'm excited to talk to you too, man. I, uh, I So I get these people that pop up in my, my feed, right, or pop up in my, we'll call it my schedule. I have a great team that puts cool people in front of me. And so I always get an opportunity to kind of lean in and find out, hey, who am I going to be interviewing and meeting for the first time today and talking? And so uh, I look through some of your stuff and I enjoyed the fact that you're a person that's just like, uh, man, go get things done kind of human. I, I, there's something to that humanity that I just, I love. And so I want to dig in today to all that area. But I usually start with one question, then I'll stop talking. You can start talking much more. Uh, the question is this. I'm walking around town. I happen to stop off at a coffee shop. You're sitting next to me. I don't know you. For some reason, you feel like you need to come talk to me. So you turn and start talking to me. In your opinion, why should I listen to you? Hmm, that's a cool question. Um, I really try to speak from a place of humility and, and be uh, the type of person who who is authentic. And uh, I certainly uh, I hate going try, you know, this whole, you know, I'm writing a book or I wrote a book and everything and um, trying to be an, an executive sometimes and, and being coming from this place of knowledge that everybody um, has to, you know, listen to me and, or like they, um, I, I think what I'm trying to get at is that I have the type of personality that um, really is looking to learn much more so than I'm looking to uh, tell people what to do. And if, yeah. if I were to talk to you in a coffee shop, I can promise you that I'd be asking a lot more questions uh, than um, speaking. Yeah, I dig that, man. I think there's something to it. I, there's a curiosity, I think, that certain people have that while, while I may be asking a question, I'm actually asking a question that makes you think about yourself. You go, ooh, I've never been asked that before. Like, <laughs> yeah. so, so in fact, you may ask me a question. I go, oh, I I don't know about it. In fact, at the end of this podcast, I'm going to ask you a question that somebody asked me while I was at a coffee shop, threw me for a loop. It's, it's a good question. We'll get through. <laughs> I'm not going to rush the, the conversation. Um, so, but the thing I know is that's not usually a natural, normal trait. Most people nowadays don't talk to other people. Where did you develop the, the desire to, to be curious about other people? Oh, geez. A lot of life experiences, but I, the one that comes to mind um, most frequently is 
my experience with my brother, Andrew. So my brother, Andrew has autism. That was why we founded our business, uh, Rising Tide Car Wash. And uh, growing up with him and getting to know other people like Andrew, you know, made me recognize that there's like a totally different way of thinking. Uh, and um, people have all different types of struggles that you may not see on the surface, you may know nothing about. And I think that's always um, been interesting to me. And, and I think more than even just interesting, it's made me um, be really empathetic. And yeah. um, that's kind of, you know, I think that coupled with always liking to learn, just like enjoying that experience of learning new things. Uh, mm -hmm. I think those, those things together made me just really curious. That's cool. Cause I mean, there is a, a different understanding that you get to experience life through when that's, you know, they have a person like that in your family. Do you know anything about my wife or my, that whole side of my, my world? No, I mean, I read your bio, but I, I didn't know. I didn't hear, learn anything about your wife. Well, this wouldn't be in the bio. It's actually, it's just my, yeah. my wife's side. I've been around her for years. So my wife got her master's in special education. And then she, uh, she ran a, a school for individuals called spectrum. It's, it's literally, it's for kids on the spectrum. And she now owns a, a day program. So an adult's age out of like the group home realm, they go to the adult, you know, and so she owned uh, three of those care facilities, the homes, 24-7. Just recently, I'm sold into another, another group, but she actually still owns the day program. So every day when I'm there with her, any time, point in time I'm there, like that's who we're hanging out with. And you're right. There's, there's a different kind of patience and appreciation and almost like a natural, uh, unique – I want to say it's like a – like, a, like when, when kids have like this, this uh, natural sense of what that what's, I'm looking for a word, man, could I not find it? An innocence. That's what it is. There's a natural, joyous innocence that just makes you like look at life and go, man, like they make you happy. If that makes sense. I, maybe I'm sure it does. I'm hoping it makes sense. to you. Yes, it does. And, and I mean, there is such a an honesty and an authenticity. Yeah. You know, no, very few of our team members ever try to be something that they aren't. And. Um, it's really cool. I mean, it's very different than I think uh, yeah. what you experience, you know, in most other places. I'd agree, man. So, so tell me more about how the, the car wash came to be, because I don't know much about it. I, I kind of know the name of it in a little bit, the rising tide car wash, but I, I held out to have uh, you share in your own words, what sure. this is all about, how it came to be. Yeah. So, um, my father, John Deary and I founded the business in 2013, uh, at this mm -hmm. point. Andrew was just kind of turning, um, he was turning 22. And, and at that point in the autism community, that means you're kind of out of the school district, out of the support system that uh, you have through your childhood. And uh, we knew we had to act for a couple of years before that we had been doing research and kind of testing different ideas to see what would work best for Andrew and, and what we felt could be a viable business. And we settled on yeah. car wash so we opened our, our first location in Parkland, Florida in mm. 2013. It was an old kind of struggling car wash that had been you know, changed hands a few times um, from when it was built uh, to when we put, got it. We renovated mm. it and we put in our, our brand and our concept and uh, we took it from when it was when we bought it. It was washing about you know 35,000 cars a year to yeah. where today it's washing over 170,000 cars a year. Wow. And because of that, we were able to kind of take the equity that we built in that location mm -hmm. and, and build two more. And wow. those were ground ups, kind of learning how to how to do that, how to how to build a location to our spec. And yeah. that's been that's been cool. And, and now that's where we are right now. We're got three locations in, in Broward County, Florida. We're employing uh, just over 100 people and, yeah. and uh, serve, serving lots of customers. And the business has been been doing great. That's, that's really all because of how good our employees with autism are. I like that, man. That's a beautiful thing. So, yeah, do break that down because there's a question I want to dig into, but there there is a uniqueness to that because you, you have special needs individuals who are in this, this place working. Can you share how that how that kind of operates and functions for you guys? Yeah. Yeah. So we take the approach and, and I mean, we, did, we certainly didn't start by taking this approach, um, but, but now after doing it for a while, we take the approach that our employees with autism are uh, the extreme users of organizational systems, right? So they have the same needs as everyone else. They're just more yeah. apparent. Gotcha. And by designing for and, and with them, uh, we've learned how to build some systems that are really clear, streamlined, and, and more inclusive, and, and that work better for everybody. So, yeah. you know, what we'll do is like, we'll take 
uh, an employee who's struggling, who, um, m- you know, most people might say, you know, this guy can't do it. He, we got to let him go. And instead of taking that approach, at least to start, we'll take the approach of how do we design this system that they're chafing up against uh, in a way where, where, where it works for them. And, and, and if it does, and if we can do that effectively, that person who's struggling the most, typically we end up with a more innovative, better process that, that works better for everyone. And by doing that over the years, and system by system, process by process, uh, we've built something where, you know, certainly not in every way does it work perfectly, uh, but it works really well, well, better than most. Yeah, that's awesome because there is a simplicity. I think what they say, you can't make something simple unless you've mastered it, right? So even to simplify it probably helps everybody involved by having to understand something to a great depth then be able to simplify it. And then anybody can mm-hmm. utilize it, more, which I can sure I can see that if you do it properly, expanding beyond, well beyond three different locations with everybody. Yeah. And so what, what are some of the challenges you faced in getting this off the ground? Because I'm real big on like, what are the off shift moments that nobody saw that were behind the scenes? You go, ah, oh, man, I don't know if it's going to work or uh, how do we improve this? Like, what are some of the things maybe stick out when I say that to you? Yeah. Yeah. So there are a few. So, so right away when we were starting this and, and we were doing our research in like 2011, 2012, there were really not a lot of examples of, of like for profit businesses that were designed and employed people with autism for most of their staff. There were some yeah. some corporate programs, um, leaders like Walgreens uh, had been doing some of their distribution centers. Um, there were some nonprofit organizations uh, that had had some some success, but but nothing like what we were trying to do that was a consumer facing business. And so there were a lot of, like we talked to a lot of experts that were like, this is never going to work. <laughs> You're getting yeah, told over and over that there's no way this is going to work. And, yeah. um, you know, my dad had been an entrepreneur at that point for, you know, 20 plus years. And, you know, he was like, we're going to, we're going to go all the way through. We're going to test it. We're going to find out for ourselves if it's going to work or not. Um, yeah. you know, take some, we'll take feedback when, where we can, but at the end of the day, we'll try, we're going to try and that's how we'll find out. Um, I like it. but there were a lot of those moments where it was like just people, I, I think it just was too, so far outside the box where, there was not a lot of confidence that, it, that we could get it done. Uh, and yeah. then I think for me, most palatably was the early days of operating. You know, I spent so much time trying to figure out how we would employ people with autism and how we would get, um, you know, how we'd find them, how we'd train them, how we'd support them. Yeah. And not nearly enough time figuring out how to run a car wash business, which is much, <laughs> much more yeah. difficult than you would think. You know, it's a big, giant, yeah. dumb robot you know, with pneumatic systems and hydraulic yeah. systems and low voltage electric. And I couldn't even yeah. hold a pair of pliers at this point. And, yeah. you know, so a lot of, a lot of long nights and getting grimy and figuring out how to make it work because if we didn't fix it, it car wash wouldn't open in, in the morning and we wouldn't work. be employing anybody. <laughs> so, you know, those yeah. were the moments that were real challenging early on. There's, there's, and I, I think I can dig into this because, so one, I get it. I'm a handyman, right? So I, I also, but I also can code websites. I can, I can create weird things and build things. But at the same time, I know what you mean. Those nights, it's kind of like, well, I can wait for a fun, I can call somebody, find the time of their schedule, have them come out, hope they don't take me for a ride on the payment because they know it's urgent, right? Or I can go, I'm about to open my brain and, and try something that I might break it. But man, if I figure it out, you know. Like, <laughs> There's something. There's something to that. Oh, yeah. do I, yeah. I? I'm I'm literally settling into moments of my past, like the the anger and sadness is sitting in my heart at the moment. Uh, but I also so with the aspect of employing individuals from the or artistic, there's a spectrum there. I don't know if most people know this, but there is a realm where quite literally there are some people you'll talk to have zero clue they're autistic. Like you just talk to them like they're, mm-hmm. but there's an air where they may be like an incredibly intelligent mm-hmm. and know more than any human being probably should know about this. Like if we're at the Asperger's scale, oh, right? Yeah. But there is that in between. How do you account for the system maybe being designed for someone at a certain level of, of uh, ability, but then maybe they're yeah. not at, maybe too high above or too far below that? Do you guys tweak it? How does that work? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a great question. So um, when you look at like the autism spectrum, about 16 percent of the autism spectrum has like significant intellectual disability. And then like mm-hmm. half of the autism spectrum has no intellectual disability, maybe. Uh, very high uh, intellectually, mm-hmm. uh, more so than average. Uh, so, mm-hmm. like you said, it's very wide. So that's why we take this approach of like, who is who's having the biggest difficulty with this, right? So, mm-hmm. the 
you know, for instance, like when we do our guide on, right, the person who, who guides the customer onto the conveyor. Um, yeah. You know, we won't find, we won't design the process or that system around the person who, who is doing the best, right? And that's, I think a lot of times that's how you do it, right? Your manager does it. The person who has the highest skill level does it, writes yeah. down how to do it, trains other people mm -hmm. how to do it, and bam. And that, I mean, that works, I think, in, in a lot of ways. But the problem with that is that that person doesn't need to wrestle with all the little details because it came naturally. Uh, yeah. So when we find our, our team member who just like they just can't do it, they're getting frustrated, their customers are confused, they're having conflict with customers. That's yeah. the person who's like, OK, where are you actually challenged in this process and how do we fix that? So like one one example yeah. of that is. You know, when you guide a customer onto the conveyor, they have to put their vehicle into neutral. Uh, some customers don't know how to find neutral. Um, if there's a lot of bright flashing lights, noises and stuff from the car wash that can be scary. That customer yeah. may have not have been to a car wash before or, or may just come a few times a year. And it's not like a, a native process for them. Yeah. So mm -hmm. they they struggle. They can't they, and they panic. And when someone panics, a lot of mm -hmm. times they get frustrated and it spirals. Yeah. So mm -hmm. we took, you know, a look at that and we're like okay how do we how do we fix this and we we just designed a really simple sign that on one side says drive forward the other side car in neutral that way you know it's a really simple in your face timely directional yeah um mm -hmm. and that made it a lot easier for our team members to to navigate the process and for customers to understand what they needed to do right and there's yeah. a lot of examples of, of of things like that that make the customer experience better but also make the employee experience better. And we typically start by designing for that, that person who's really struggling. And that makes yeah. it where pretty much everyone can use it. I like that. You're alluding to things that are so common in all businesses. Like I've owned a gym business, consulting business. Yeah. I speak now. I do online coaching. I podcast, right? There's all these little areas. And every single one of them, in order to be able to repeat the, we'll call it the success of, of any success, right? If something goes right, I want to repeat that. You have to be able to say, okay, where can I, where can I improve it? What I like that you're talking to is saying, we're taking the far end of each side of this, like, you know, a person who is like, they'll call it worst case scenario. And you're trying to pre-engineer a process that makes it easy for that person. Because if it's easy for them, I'll look at it and go, oh, why is this sign even made? Right? Some exactly. people look at that sign and be like, why does this sign even exist? Yeah. Right? Why do you need that? And yeah. <laughs> Like neutral, right? But I think that there's something in it for everybody because no matter what we're trying to do in life, there's a spot in our life where we are going to find frustration. And, and sometimes it's just a matter of simplifying it for ourselves, for other people. If your staff is not doing things proper, it's like, look at the person who you'd be like, this person can't exist because they do. And then go, how do I fix it for them? So I, I love it's been figured out. So how do you expand that to multiple locations? Because there's an idea of like this worked here at this place. Do you mm -hmm. test something at one point before you take it everywhere else? Or like, how oh, yeah. do you, what's your process to bring new systems into the whole business overall? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, we're, we start with, we, we try to take um, like a design thinking and prototyping approach to things. So yeah, yeah for, very first thing that we'll do is like, we'll do some observation where like, like I said, who's struggling, why are they struggling? That's a hypothesis. So mm -hmm. we'll take, yeah that and then say, okay, well, we think we can fix it by doing this. And then we'll introduce it to that person. We won't spend a ton of time or a ton of money on building that first design. We'll just get mm -hmm. it as quick and dirty as we possibly can to get it back into the hands of that person. So they can mm -hmm. tell us or show us in some cases, if they're not verbally able to tell us, they can show us yeah. if it's working or not. And then we iterate mm -hmm. and we iterate and always at one location and generally with only a couple people to start. Yeah. And then, you know, we expand it from there to the one whole staff and then company wide if it's working well. And a big part of that, too, is making sure you have the right measurement systems in place to show that like it's actually working because we tend to fall yeah. in love with our own ideas. Right. So, yeah, we do. you know, we, you know, we think it's working. It's great. And then you throw it to everybody. It's like that didn't work at all. You just made it different, not better. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've <laughs> seen whole companies do this with like whole programs and apps they create is going to be great. And then they spend like a million dollars on it. It goes to the world and the world goes, I hate this. And they trash it yeah. immediately. Like, yeah. <laughs> that does happen. And so I, I, I was picking these questions because I want to know how your mind works. And so I, I love the idea of 
of the kind of people you're working with, how you put them in positions. And then it's interesting is you, you've gone the extra level to fill in the gaps in areas that they don't have the, the amount of strengths, but then you make it an, a strength because over time they'll get efficient at this and effective yeah. and, and it, everybody wins. And so leading into it, like there was a discussion about a book and your book's called The Power of Potential. I think I can see, we'll call it sifting through the lines where this becomes the book for you to write. So without me jumping in and giving an explanation or even thoughts on it, in your own words, what, what was the carryover for you to go, man, I've got this, this cool message inside of me. Let me write this book on it. Yeah. So um, over the course of, of the business, we've had a couple like lightning in a bottle moments where we've got like big media attention. We, we got to be on the nightly news a couple times uh, on the Today mm-hmm. Show. Uh, we were on the cover of Entrepreneur Magazine. And every time one of these things hits, you, we get like just an outpouring of, of generally parents that were like, how did you do this? Like, I want to build something like this for my kid. Uh, yeah. So when we, you know, obviously we can't help all of those people individually. We're yeah, trying to build our own business. So, you know, our first inclination was let's build like entrepreneurship training for these parents yeah. so they can, you know, emulate us in whatever way, whatever business works for them, their budget, their yeah. co- specific context, their region. So we, we partnered with the University of Miami and the Taft Foundation to build this online course and um, a series of workshops around mm-hmm. this training. And it was really great. And we've had many people go through over 20 businesses have been founded through it. And that's created probably a couple hundred jobs. And yeah. that's great. But what we learned about on that process is it's really it's a really difficult proposition for, a, you know, let's say a a 55 or so year old person who has a, a child who's 22 ish and that they have um, never been an entrepreneur, never really wanted to be an entrepreneur. Um, mm-hmm. So they um, were, you know, for, for them to be able to um, take that step at that age, it doesn't really, um, you know, it doesn't really, it's very difficult. It's a, yeah. it's a very hard proposition. Mm-hmm. What we, yeah. we found probably made more sense was working with the small, medium size business leaders that already have businesses and are looking for ways to differentiate their brand to make their businesses work better. And we felt mm-hmm. we had a solution for that. So we pivoted from, OK, let's work specifically with parents to now, yeah. you know, let's work with small, medium sized business leaders because there's a lot better skill fit that way. So gotcha. that was the inspiration yeah. for the book. That makes sense because it's true, man. There's a lot of things that, that <laughs> there's a lot of businesses that are, they're not really a business that is in business. They're, uh, they're, they're trading time for money, but like a business means I cannot do that thing and it still gets done and the company still makes revenue. Like they're, that's, that's right. an actual business. And, and so that's why when I hear you talking to, we engineer, we create, we think through, then we expand to different locations. I'm like, that's, that's what I think a lot of people aren't hearing when it comes to business. And what happens is, even if they have a success, you, you don't have it again because you have no idea what you did the first time. Mm-hmm. And so it becomes yeah. drudgery. You're, you're beating your head against a wall for years. You can't take breaks. And then you, you fall out of love with this amazing thing you could have done. So in the book, do you address some of that kind of conversation of any kind of systems? I'm assuming it's got to be – maybe it's like a make assumption. I'm going to let you answer the question. Does the book have any kind of idea around that kind of stuff? Yeah. So um... – Essentially, the, the, the book is centered around this idea that there are, are four hidden problems that hold businesses back from, from achieving success. And these four problems were ones that our employees with autism, they helped us solve. And the first mm-hmm. one is, is being able to objectively um, assess talent and mm-hmm. hire people based on their actual skills instead of your biases uh, in, in a, what is generally a very flawed hiring process. The second yeah. is driving clarity through everything that you do. We tend to focus on what makes us unique, what's exciting about the business, right? That's yeah. what, why we, why we became entrepreneurs to begin with, right? Like our special sauce, but that's not what makes you successful over time. It's how do you make that, that message clear and precise so it can be replicated. And then third, that, you know, your managers are good enough. You put the, you put people out there, they have a relative idea of what to do and they'll figure it out. And, and to some extent you have to do that, but, um, that's, I mean, people quit their managers, right? They don't tend to quit their jobs. The job. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. So like, how did we, how do you 
build coaching and compassion and leadership into the into the organization. And then the third is how do you actually design an employee experience that that works for everyone? And by doing those things, you unlock psychological safety, uh, ethical accountability, purpose for your entire team, which culminates in a, a really delightful customer experience and a brand that people want to support. Um, so that's kind of the you know the way that it, we aim to support entrepreneurs. A book, and yeah. and me personally, in no way, shape, or form, am I like a, an autism expert. Uh, mm -hmm. That's really for the people who have autism, for the neurodivergent yeah. individuals that we work with. Mm -hmm. I, we've just learned how to how to um, design things around observing and working with those individuals, and yeah. it's just you know. Great design is all about constraints, right? So we, we gave ourselves a serious constraint at the beginning, which was 80% yeah. of our staff would be on the autism spectrum. Mm -hmm. So, you know, by doing that, it just made us really be really intentional about how do we do all of these things. And yeah. at some point we realized like, these, these aren't autism problems, right? These are, these are just business problems that our yeah. employees with autism are, are helping us see much better than we otherwise would have. Mm -hmm. That's true, man, because there's a lot of things because there's a lot of dynamics that that you wouldn't even realize, like who's taking them to and from work, you know, who's taking care of like, you know, the, the basic stuff, film paperwork. Out. Like there's a lot of having to interact with individuals that are their caregivers. Right. So that's one mm -hmm. part of it. And I just I just know from the experience, my wife, you've actually talked about opening a so she has a location that's in a, you know, a, a nice shopping area and there's another location available. And she's like, I want to open that and then like make a thrift stop, you know, a thrift store sort of thing. Yeah. So people that are there she could teach them to work at the thrift store and i'm like it's a great idea because people can come yeah. in they can learn the hopes so of their learning skills that they can take with but but there's also that that the idea you're talking about is like you have to be able to create all these different levels and, and stressors and when you work with individuals who are going to be harder to work with than your average you know person walking around town it allows it so my i guess i'm leading in a question does it make it easier for you to to hire and work with people that aren't on the spectrum absolutely so we, you know, good example, um, the way that we do our nightly cash out procedure. So like the cash that we take in for the day, it's got to be balanced. So, our, you know, we have the same amount of money that we opened with the, that, that day that we're going to open it with the next day. And then the rest is the, is the profit that we put into the safe. Right. Yeah. And we were having a ton of issues making sure this was accurate every night. No one was stealing or anything, but it was just not accurate. It was like 31% yeah. of the time we'd be you know, over a couple bucks, under a couple bucks. And by working with our team members with autism, the ones who are struggling the most with, with this process, uh, we designed like this kind of essentially like a monopoly board for, for counting cash, right? You put different yeah. money in different spots. It's all color coded. It's got a little formula on it. it makes it really mm -hmm. simple to do. And yeah. so that, that helped us reduce our, our nightly cash out errors from 31% to 4%. But what mm -hmm. it also did was it allowed us to take someone who was you know, neurotypical, like a high school student um, that had never closed cash, never handled cash before, to after one training yeah. session for 30 minutes can now close cash, where before yeah. that would take, you know, a, a manager sitting with them for, you know, hours and yeah. you know, multiple sittings. And, and that's, you know, how it how it kind of works and, and that's again just one small example of how it how it happens i like that man there's this there's some beauty in this i can so i can genuinely see how this all can be like just to learn the skill set of doing that's going to be helpful like i i have people in my company where i have to create trainings and programs actually i'm bringing a va on here pretty soon cool and i have to prepare the trainings for her this friday so that i can have her be prepared to be trained on monday and there's things in place but i've had some new team come in so i'm going back through everything from the first time but, but as I'm hearing this, I'm going, man, this is what allows companies to actually be able to scale and grow. Because I don't think many people understand it is not a great thing to have a bunch of clients if a bunch of clients have a bad experience. Yeah, like, I exactly. Think this is a lot of like, oh, we're going to get this. Well, dude, it's so much more frustration. And so not only do you help the people that are working for you, but you help yourself in the long run to be able to, to, to make them happy so that you can grow without having – you know, the fear of answering the phone have been, you know, gun shy if all of a sudden someone's calling to complain again. Like it's, yeah. it's a problem. Uh, where do you think someone should start with, uh, with, so let's say somebody hears this right now, they go, okay, well, I have a company or someone I know has a company, they're struggling with their staff. My wife is one of these people. Like having these 
where should they start when it comes to, we'll call it neurotypical humans that like she yeah. interacts with? And like, how do I get them to the simple things? Like where should someone start with creating this ease of flow for people? Yeah. So picture the person who you're most frustrated with on your staff, the person who's like, ah, oh, why can't, why can't they get this? Right? Like, why yeah. can't you just do this? I told you how to do it. Why can't you do mm -hmm. it? And a lot yeah. of times that's the person who's like, I just, you know, I got to get rid of Danny. Danny's got to go. Right. He sucks. Yeah. And mm -hmm. changing is from, okay, maybe Danny sucks or maybe the system that he's working with sucks. And let me just take a step back, pause, talk to him. You know, why is, what's really bought, what, what's really making this hard for you and yeah. watch. And you might find that, you know what, that's not really very clear. Is it like, I know how to do it because I've done it a hundred times, but you yeah. know, that makes sense that you don't get that. Why you keep messing up here and work with that person, bring that person in as a partner to fix mm -hmm. that one thing. Right. Yeah. And that might work. And, and, you know, you might find that there's a bunch of other opportunities to do that in your business. And, you know, even if the first outcomes aren't great, right? Like maybe Danny does suck and Danny's got to go, <laughs> but yeah, it's, possible. Uh, it's possible. It's possible. That's the case too. Um, but at least now Danny knows that you're trying, you're working with him. You're in there with him right next to him, trying to make it happen and not just telling him that he sucks. And, you know, you, you made that effort first. Yeah. And I think that that experience yep. too, people start to feel like you listen, like you care. And, you know, yeah. I think that's something that leaders struggle with because most of us care, right? I mean, most people who run businesses like genuinely care about the people who they, who work for them, but it's difficult yeah. to show that every day, you know, when you're stressed mm -hmm. and you got a million things going on. Um, but this is a practice that shows that too. It shows, Hey, you know, he's working with me. Like he just, spent an hour talking to me about a problem I'm having and has like actionable ways that he's going to try to fix it. Like that matters. Yeah, it does. And when you have a staff and team of people that are doing a good job and they are doing it because you know that you're, they're being taken care of. It's, it's powerful. It's, it's, it's different than just showing up to a regular job where they're like, man, I, I, it's pretty much whoever pays me, I'm staying. Because mm. when it gets to a point where, where they feel appreciated, like there's people who will take less pay to be in a position where they feel appreciated. That matters for human beings, I think. Yeah. And what I think you you also because you've been doing it so long, I think you're glossing over it unintentionally. And you say you say, and in my head I go, I've had these moments. They were not as fun. <laughs> when yeah. you said like sometimes you have to try it again, I'm like sometimes you'll sit there, and you'll you'll have this thing you thought through it a million times, and then you do it, and someone doesn't get it. It's like what are you what are you doing? How can you not? You're right. I think there's this moment where I've I, I I don't know when it was, but I realized like it needs to be for me frustratingly simplified. Like it needs to be mm -hmm. almost for me, I, I need to get frustrated with how simple I have to make this. Mm -hmm. And that's when it becomes easy and very simple for someone else to get it. And yeah. what you're alluding to is you, bringing it down. That's going to be more mental energy from you than you realize. If, if I'm oh, listening yeah. to this, it's, it's going to be you banging your head against the wall going, well, how do I make this even more simple? I, how much? And then you do. And it's like, but that skill set creates patience for you, creates understanding for you. And then at the end of the day, you get an outcome. It's positive because if you don't do this, you get to have one of two headaches. One headache is what I just talked about. The other headache is to have to keep hiring people or keep retraining people or getting frustrated that doing the job wrong, doing the job yourself. So you can trade this, this one lump sum now of frustration and figure it out. Or you can have an enduring level of frustration that's like a low level but doesn't stop. Yep. Yep. And it's also like eventually you reprogram yourself to when you're running into these problems you know, your initial reaction may still be frustration. It probably will be, mm -hmm. but very quickly, like, you know what? I've been through this before. And I know at the other yeah. side of this frustration might be a really cool solution that I haven't thought of yet. And yeah. like, that's a fun process, right? I think inherently most entrepreneurs, they like to build things. So yeah. it's fun to, you know, Hey, here's an opportunity for me to put my skills to work and make my employees lives better. And, you know, we yeah. don't typically, you know, put that type of intentional thought into the way our employee experience is like our customer experience. But a lot of times that becomes the foundation of the customer experience that we haven't, um, you know, we haven't really put any effort into. I agree, man. It's funny you say that I was just, before I came here, I was, I took a trip to go do something. I was at a buddy and, and I just, you know, we were talking back and forth and somehow the conversation came up about, about this and staff and work with people. And I think it's like a, the retirement conversation came around and, wanting to continue to work because the enjoyment of work. And I'm like, that is something that I've always yeah. tried to do. I've owned 
you know, brick and mortar businesses. I've owned online businesses. And I've always realized that if I want my people, like the, my clients to be treated well, I have to treat my people well. That That's yes. the, the paramount to it. Because if you don't do that, then what happens is they're going to be in and out. And then your clients look at you and go, well, there's got to be something off of people. If the re- recycling of human beings, it's just always just new human beings in place. It doesn't feel like the, the relationship and continuity and trust is built. And on top of that, the interactions become sometimes just cut and dry. You know, it's black and white. And like, I like people to feel a connection to the company. I want them to feel like they're appreciated. So you have to appreciate your people to do that. And I love what you're talking through is when you do sit down with someone and ask them, how do we make this easier? And they feel like they're part of it. That does create that. It creates that where they have a, an affinity for the company. And it's, they, it's not just them doing a job. They're actually doing something to serve people because they believe in the company's vision. That's right. Absolutely. Something to it, man. Where, where else do you ever see, like, do you see yourself ever branching off and to try something else besides this? Or like taking these skills you have and, and trying your hand at some other business? Have you been doing that or is that not in the, the cards? Well, to be honest, right now, I'm fully invested in car washes. Uh, we really yeah. like it. We think there's a big opportunity to continue to grow the business. Uh, mm-hmm. But I do think that these, these kind of things scale to lots of different businesses. And, yeah. you know, there's, there's other things that, like, I'd love to do. Um, but I really, I get, as you can probably see, <laughs> I get a lot of satisfaction from, like, solving the little operational challenges and yeah, as yeah. we try to scale this business like there's a lot of them so mm-hmm. it's like an kind of for me at this point like an unending amount of you know inspiration yeah. and you know every morning i thank god for having the opportunities to solve these these problems because it gets me up and excited to go about my day what if so- what if somebody came to you from like, I don't know, a large billion dollar company and goes, hey, we want to hire you to be a COO of this. Would you ever jump ship to go do that? Oh, probably not. No, no not like at this that. point. No. True entrepreneur. I just want to yeah, put it out there. I don't, think I, could, I don't think I could work for um, a large somebody company else at this point. It'd be really difficult. <laughs> I don't doubt it, man, especially when you have control because the, the things that you're talking to are things that I, I find a lot of companies lack. I don't, I, sometimes the product is just good enough. They get enough reach where they can just hang on. But if if they took half of your brain and put it in some of these people's heads, it would be the business would run ridiculously smooth. Like it's crazy how some of these companies, they still survive. And I, I can't get calls back from some people. I'm, dumb headaches that make zero sense. I'm like, you guys couldn't engineer that out in the last however many years that yep. they just don't do it. So. But I give you a lot of credit for doing that. So what's the future look like for you guys? Like out of curiosity, like you got three running, everything looks good. You're moving and smooth. You got, you're, you're branching into teaching these other, other people, the 20 businesses, how to do some of the same stuff. What does the future look like for you guys in your head? You got yeah, opportunity I, wise. Um, so like right now we're, we're trying to uh, raise around to do a large scale expansion. So we'd okay. like to see this business get to, you know, 30, 40, 50 locations in the next yeah. seven or so years. That would be, that's the, that's the pipe dream. Yeah. I'd love to see it. Happen. I like it. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good dream though. I always hear of uh, that. So I, I obviously I used to play sports. Most of the time yeah. when guys get out, they, they get into a few businesses. It's mortuaries of all uh, people get into laundromats, car washes, mm-hmm. like there's a couple different things they get into. And so I, I like the idea of like this kind of that and fruit bowls. People get into these these fruit bowl companies. You see those? They're good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're, I love them. <laughs> we almost we almost got my wife and I almost stepped into one of those, and we're like, nah. We even almost got a jumpy pit business. We were like uh, seriously about a week away from pulling trigger. Is that a good like, business? Ah, uh, you know, it's a good business if you want to be part of the business. It is. I don't think it's much of a business. It's more of a a job you own. You can make some decent money, but it's it's definitely a, an, an everyday thing. And I'm not in the realm of desire to yeah. be doing something like that that I don't absolutely love. Sure. Um, yeah, dude. Uh, but no, it's cool because I, I can see that going all over the place. I, what? How do you draw people in? Because this is the thing. I, I always look at it as a season of when people aren't washing cars. How do you still keep the thing running and functioning when there's like rain going on all the time? Like I've always yeah. been curious how these places function and operate. Yeah. So obviously on those days, we don't wash a lot of cars. Um, yeah, yeah, I think so. <laughs> uh, you know, we, we focus on cleaning and training on those days. So, you know, we're selling clean. Mm. This The location mm-hmm. has to be really clean in order to meet that yeah. brand proposition. And so yeah. we're, we're, we're scrubbing down all the arches. We're pressure cleaning stuff, detailing, nice. you know, the lobby. Uh, and then we're, we're training, right? So, I mean, we're always training, but like those are the days where 
will do like the more in-depth trainings where a manager is actually going to, you know, walk someone through like each piece of equipment or a new process where, you know, mm -hmm. on days where we're busy, it's a lot more like we've got video based and like text based training where, you know, yeah. someone will get the opportunity to do that over the course of the day and then they'll get coached mm -hmm. by a manager, but it's not as, as in depth or, or like one to one. Those are the types yeah. of things we tend to do on those days. And, you know, the subscription part of the business where people pay a monthly fee and can come to get the car wash as many times as they want. That helps, you yeah. know, tide us over when it's when the weather isn't good either. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's a pretty high margin, you know, grosses, the gross margins on, on these businesses are pretty good. So yeah. you, you can survive and have a you know few rainy days every month. It's no big deal. Yeah, it's pretty cool, man. That's how it's, I always drive by his car wash out here, the self car washes. We, we go to car wash around a corner. I, those little things like I'm like, that'd be cool to have like a, a little business like that. I mean, when I get older, I'll try something like this out. Or if you guys expand, you want some franchisees. Yeah, man, there I mean, you go. I might get bored, uh, but it's cool because I, I, I think the part of it that I like the most is that as a human being, you seem like you care, which is a big, big piece of it. And two, there's this um, this drive to improve. I, I haven't heard this thing about financial growth and all, while it's part of it, obviously, yeah. I almost feel like you, you get tickled by solving the problems more than you do with making the money. And I like that. Not that you shouldn't want to make the money because you yeah, do. You, you got to do both, but. But yes, yeah, that, that doesn't get me out of yeah. bed in the morning. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a good way to say it. I think there's something yeah. to that in entrepreneurship. When anybody's trying to start something, if, if, you, if you're doing it just because a dollar a paycheck, it eventually will get dreary. And not every time, yeah. you better find that there's some way to have that, that fuel a dream or a hobby. But if you end up just, if money's the end destination, you'll get there. And I have everybody I've met that, that that was the destination and arrived at it, like they just, they got dead inside. Because like, what yeah. are you... What do you get out of bed for now? So repositioning, redirecting is a big piece too. It's also that motivator, right? I mean, it's such an extrinsic yeah. thing, right? Like it doesn't bring you anything until you get it. And then when you get it, you're like, ah, didn't really bring me anything anyway. Um, yeah. You know, you try, it's to, not fulfilling. Like, try to focus on the things that make you feel good through the process of doing them. Yeah. Then it feels good to, to have the money, spend the money out because the, the people because you're doing something that's got to be very fulfilling and the people you're helping yeah. creating, you know, jobs for and, and life for them. And I can I can imagine a lot of those parents probably that, that see their kid there. It's like they got to roll up there and go, hold, I never thought this was possible for my child. And so yeah. it becomes this like you get to have that moment of like, yeah, I helped create that for, for everybody involved. And that, that's a powerful motivator to continue to keep doing it. So I for sure I appreciate that. Um, dude, as we come to a close here. Where can I send people to find out more about your business, yourself, and your book? Yeah, so our website, risingtidecarwash.com, is the best spot for it. Uh, you learn all about our business. We've got a page on the book there. You can pre-order the book. We've actually got a, a pre-sale promotion going on where if you buy the book, um, you get our that entrepreneur course that I mentioned uh, for free, which is normally $499, nice. so it's free if you, you buy the book um, up until – to launch awesome. and uh, then we also have our rising tide U website so that's rising tide u.com uh, so we've got some more training material there as well awesome man i like it i like it all right you ready for the final question yeah man here it goes what promise did god make to the world when he created you that there would be someone who really cared about, oh boy, this is, this is definitely, so somebody asked you this at a, at a coffee shop? <laughs> a coffee shop, man. They asked me at a coffee shop and it hit me like it's hitting you. Yeah, Cause it makes yeah. you think deeper than just what I want to do. It's like, what's, what's my purpose? Am I living it? And the promise is different. A promise is beyond just like the other oh, dude. Like it's, it's, I, I think we know it sometimes and, and are we doing it? It's the next question you have in your head, but I'm going to leave it at that. What is the promise yeah. you believe was made for you? Yeah. Someone who really cares about helping people work through and meeting their individual potential. Um, for mm -hmm. me, that's a lot of these systems, right? But at the root of it, it's that I'm, I'm, I want, I aspire, at least I definitely don't meet this every day but I certainly aspire every day to help people reach their goals. And, um, you know, it's a really good question that I'll have to 
I have to think more about too because it's uh, that's that's really cool. The, the person who asked you that yeah. has been a really cool person. Oh yes, Jr. Man, Jr. Reed. He's a good dude. He does a lot with baseball players. Former baseball player himself. And and it is. It's one that that you spend time thinking. And I found that the, the answer may change. It's different seasons, right? I think there's a different promise that I, I you fulfill a promise. You go, oh well, I fulfilled that at the moment that I was introduced to a new promise that goes, okay, that maybe that was the reason. I think we spent a lifetime uncovering new things. And so, yeah, but it yeah. is. It's one where you stop and you pause, and it's it's service oriented, right? It's not mm -hmm. just this thing where it's like what, yeah. what's your purpose here i gotta make this amazing apple iphone which nothing wrong with that but then if you think about the promise made to humanity it's different it's a different flow yeah. so i yeah spend some time with that man it spend some time with it it'll I uh will. It'll what was your it. answer it will so it's changed over the time but my answer at this point in time is i'm a person who will be an example of what can be created out of craziness like i've done i've experienced craziness cool. in life and you know a lot of stuff but like i want to be an example yeah. of what you can create out of it it's it can be an amazing, useful tool if you learn how to have all the hardships become reasons to do great as opposed to reasons why you can get away with doing bad. That's really cool, man. I, I love that. So that's what I do. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. Not many people always ask me, so I appreciate you asking. Dude, uh, seriously, thank you for your time. Thank you for hanging out with us. Uh, those of you who are all out in the world listening and hanging out, thank you for spending some time with us. I know you could have been anywhere else in the world. If something that was stated today resonated with you, if something hits you and you go, man, that, that's hey, it's hooking into my brain and it's, it's growing some roots in a positive way, by all means, act on it. If you know someone that needs to hear this, share the episode with them. But outside of that, as always, make the most of your awe shift moments so you can make shift happen. It's Anthony Trucks and Thomas Derry signing off. Hey, thank you for tuning in to the Aw Shift Podcast. I pray that we gave something amazing to your life. And if you found this episode served you in some way, I would love you could share it with people you know, people you love, as well as your community, because you never know who needs that simple little seed that can grow into something amazing for their life. And the actual training doesn't stop here. If you want your free copy of the show notes sent to you after every episode so you can get the major points consolidated down, simply go to textanthony.com and message the word notes. Till next time, make shift happen.